Assalamu alaikum. Sayyid Farooq Hassan is back with a new episode of Sky is the Limit. Today I have a very, very special guest all the way from China. As we all know, China is one of our fastest friends. It has been there with us through thick and thin. Our friendship has no boundaries. It's higher than the Himalayas, deeper than the oceans, sweeter than honey, and I can go on and on. And this friend of mine whom I'm going to interview today and introduce to you is a very, very famous vlogger. She has more than 3 million followers on social media and she's all over. She happened to visit Pakistan and I thought it would be best to catch her and introduce her to all of you. I have the pleasure of having Li Jingjing with me today. She is a very, very experienced journalist all the way from China. Hello, Li. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So I, I know you've picked up Urdu language over the last three, four days that you've been here. Just a brief intro of uh, Jing Jing. She is a political commentator with the state media in China, CGTN. She hosts a popular show which is called Talk It Out with Li Jing Jing. Uh, she's a social media personality with millions of followers, as I told you. She's also well known for her travel vlog, JJ on the Road. She has extensive knowledge of China's poverty alleviation project and policies. We're going to talk a bit about that and, of course, the BRI and CPEC. She has traveled extensively across China and to many other countries also, and she has documented it in her vlogs. We're going to talk about that. She was also awarded as an outstanding journalist by China's National Radio and Television Administration. Only 10 people all across China have had the honor to receive this award, and I happen to be sitting with one of them. So Li Jingjing is here. Li, first of all, a very, very formal welcome to you, uh, to Pakistan, you. and to Sky's the Limit. We are honored and thrilled to have you as a guest. So, I would like you to begin your life's journey because the basic purpose of this program is to inspire the youngsters mm -hmm. and to tell the people of all over the world actually mm -hmm. what Pakistan is all about. Mm -hmm. So tell me, where did you start your journey from in China? Where were you born? How many siblings? Mm -hmm. Tell us all about it. So thank you so much, Farooq, for having me on this show. I'm so honored and I've been in Pakistan for or five days now and I have been having a really great time everywhere I go first I visit first visit wow. and everyone give me so much a welcome and hospitality love so respect yes that's what <laughs> Pakistanis you. are all about so I really enjoy the time here so about me uh, I was born and raised in China uh, Chinese and so I in Beijing not in Beijing, but I was born in a very northern part of China called Heilongjiang province. Okay. And that shares the border with Russia. Okay. So it's a very cold, cold region. I was okay. born there, but I think my parents uh, maybe helped me to define my, my, my life as, as someone who always on the road. I've been moving from one province to another province in China, and then I, I got my bachelor degree in journalism in China and a master degree in journalism in the UK wow. and I always travel around the world always trying to experience different cultures okay so do you have any other siblings like uh, brother sisters not at you're all you're the only one only one I was the generation that was under the one child policy ah, so I was, I'm the only you're... kid in okay. my family and and so tell us about your tell us about the schooling in China and especially you are uh, living in a a uh, small town, you said, you know, like bordering Russia. Mm. Uh, how was uh, how was the culture there? How was the early schooling? Tell us about it. Were you into extracurricular activities like mm -hmm. debates, sports? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in China, there's a thing. There's a like a stereotypical image about people from my region. I'm from the northeast of China, so there's a term called northeast people. Okay. And uh, when you mention those people, people will relate to someone with 
that has always been loud and aggressive okay. and just like me. The war warrior, warrior qualities, huh? Yeah, yeah. Like in all, like physically, they tend to be much bigger and stronger. And uh, personality, they're they're the ones that most fierce, always want to make challenges, mm. ah. and always <coughs> aggressive. And women are very <laughs> women are very demanding. Yeah. If anything is, you know, like in China, in that part of China, uh, there are sometimes there are domestic violence, but it's normally the women <laughs> who beat up the men. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the okay. truth. So you know so that's something new. <laughs> yeah. So I think that region or that culture defines my personality as very outgoing, not aggressive. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I'm very social, outgoing, very social, very active. happy, very okay. loud. Okay. When I, whenever I went walk into a place, all my colleagues, all my friends know. Okay, Jing Jing is coming here. Ah. Like she's the one stomping into the you office. You will make your mark without telling them that you're there. Yeah, always laughing out loud. And so, so in school, how is the how is the school culture there in China? School in China and probably in Ho. East Asia, like uh, Japan, South Korea, China, uh, is quite intensive. Disciplined, honestly. very disciplined. Very disciplined, very intensive. Be I think maybe one reason is because we have too many people, too many kids. So sometimes one class we have like 60 students, 80 students, a lot of people, and it's it's very competitive. We have to really, really work hard, study hard to get into middle school, high school, and university. Uh, it's like we, when I was a kid, I was the one that didn't have much time to enjoy a sports class or a musical class because those classes uh, back in the days, like 20 years ago, it, it's not, it's deemed as useless. And only classes like math. Physics, ah, uh, regardless. Chemistry. Yeah, okay, those classes are like important. Who with that will give you jobs? Future real, oriented. Yeah, real jobs. <laughs> like, so it's very competitive, and uh, we studied. And were you a bright student? Like the top three were you in the no, class? No, not at all. Average. Average. Okay. Average. Because okay. I'm not good at math. I'm not good at the physics. Ah. I'm, well, from my personality, you know, I'm the one who who enjoys. Uh, like classes like uh, Chinese, English, uh, playing, the fun stuff, mm. uh, which most parents will think, oh, that's, that's... That's not the <laughs> futuristic skills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about sports and um, extracurricular, like debates and all? Didn't exist much when I was in primary school dramatics? and middle school. Dram drama dramatics? No, no. no. I think it's changing now. So nowadays, the young generations, they have much more fun school class. Um, the and parents because their parents are much more educated, and uh, like because f for example many people from my generations are bec are parents now, so they are educated. So they are changing what they didn't like when they were kids. Mm -hmm. So they try to give <coughs> everything the okay. best for their kids. They send send them overseas. They send them to different extracurriculum classes like uh, fancy stuff, all the fancy sports, horse racing, um, all these. I mean, everything you know. No, so but so school was just studies. That's what you're saying? Yes. More studies. 90% studies and probably 10% socializing. I think it's the same for, still it's the same for same many, culture. many uh, people, especially for children from uh, less developed cities. Because education in China is the, is the thing that will change your life, no matter mm. what class, what background you come from. Okay. So many kids from very impoverished family, they study hard, they can get into good universities, and they can get a very good job, so they can really change their, the dynasty of their families. Fair enough. Fair so enough. they work really, really hard. I think that works true for all parts of the world. Education is what makes the change. Yeah. But what I get from you is that if more focus was on studies and less focus on dramatic sports and all, so w wouldn't it be a very dull kind of an environment in the school? Like yeah, Always back study, in the study, days. study, study, study. Yeah. They were, it was like that. It so was. how do you develop those skills in you? Like you are now being followed by more than Thank three you. million Thank people. You. How did you develop this skill like mm. in such a short span of time? I think first is my personality. I'm just a very happy, outgoing person. Right so from day one. Yeah. So even if the teacher scolded you, you were happy. At first, I will, I mean, I will try to uh, refrain myself. But you know, you cannot control what you already are. So <laughs> yeah. eventually, when you find the opportunity, we're like, okay, I'm going to be myself today. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. uh, first is that. Second is, um, 
even I graduated from school, I never stopped studying. So I keep, and I, I think going to different countries really help you to grow. Studying different cultures. Yeah. So you pick up the best from every culture. Okay. And to just... To develop yourself and yeah, enhance exactly. your knowledge, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sports, you weren't, you never played any games when you went in school? Sports, Football, okay. table, table tennis, yes. badminton. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad Chinese in terms of that. I'm okay. not good at table tennis. <laughs> table tennis always reminds me of China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why uh, I'm a bad Chinese because I don't play uh, table tennis. You call it ping pong, right? Ping pong, ping yes. Pong, yeah. And also, I'm not, I don't play violin. I'm okay. not good at math. I was like, oh, I'm horrible. I don't match up with Pakistan. all the stuff. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, that uh, you went to the school, you were an average student, but obviously good in interpersonal skills and all. And then what about college? What courses, what subjects did you take in your college mm -hmm. studies? Like uh, arts, sciences, uh, biology, medicine, what? So I studied um, in China, bachelor's degree is about, it's called broadcast and anchoring, but it's, it's categorized into journalism. Mm -hmm. So I studied journalism in China and, uh, and also went to UK uh, to got my master's degree, also in broadcast journalism. Okay. So it's the same major, but in two different languages and in two different cultures. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate this experience because it helped me to understand the journalism culture in the West and in the East. And uh, I got to know what audiences from both cultures think, uh, how to write and uh, do videos uh, do fancy shows like yours mm. in two different languages. Okay. So that's the privilege I got from the study experiences. How hard was it like switching from Chinese, your native language, to English, spoken English and written Very English? Very hard. Very hard? Very difficult because I th uh, unlike here, English is really not our native languages. Most people don't speak English in China. Mm -hmm. So we ha it's our second language we only acquire in middle school, but you know you don't still don't spend Speak too much it, time yeah, on, okay. on it. So uh, even though you can pass the ELTS uh, exam, which English exam, you can pass with a certain score, but still doing interviews in a different culture on the streets uh, with people with different accents. Yeah. So like I thought my English was good enough, but then when I arrived in the UK and it doing is. interviews, I'm like, oh my God, what are you talking about? I don't understand because they have <laughs> Scottish accent, oh, yeah, Sheffield yeah. accent. It's a multicultural society, yeah. obviously, from that perspective. And also reciting uh, my scripts for, for camera was so challenging mm -hmm. and, and learning laws in the UK. I was like, I don't even know what those words mean in Chinese and I'm learning this in English. In English. So uh, after your school, who inspired you or who motivated you to take up journalism in your college? Like your father, your mother, your friends, who? Hmm, not a particular person, okay. but journalism. Being a journalist is something I always wanted to do mm -hmm. since I was a kid. Oh. I remember, you know, in primary school, a teacher will ask you what do you want to be in the future when you grow up, right? Some say scientists, firemen, police. Doctor, engineer. Yeah. So I was in fifth grade in primary school. My answer was being a journalist. And how, where did that thought come from? Were you watching any particular journalist, some inspiration? It's probably that. I can't remember why. And I think back then when I was a kid, I didn't even really know what being a journalist mean. But I just think, wow, that's something I want to do. You got to go to different places and mm. talk to different people. Mm. That's, something, that's something really fun. So, and I walked exactly the same path. Um, and all my studies, all my degrees well, is in journalism. All my work experience is about j being a journalist. Okay. So I've been working as a journalist in China for 10 years now. 10 so years now. So all I've been doing is and being a journalist. And you're working with the biggest channel, like CGTN, right? Yes. The state media, basically. Mm -hmm. So after your college, you, you were doing journalism. Then you went to Sheffield mm -hmm. uh, in the UK. And you, you did your uh, mass journalism yep. degree from there. Mm -hmm. And you said that was a good experience in terms of learning English as a language, mm -hmm. which you weren't fluent in before that. <laughs> and then you did your degree and you stayed there or you came back to China? I came back to China. You came back to China. Yeah. And how did this concept of vlogging start? Well, mm. Who gave you that, this thought to create more followers and you know, like mm. be where you are right now? So, you know, vlog is, 
It really only got trendy in recent years, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I'm still one of the young <laughs> generations, one of the young you know, generations. I love watching other people's vlogs. Mm -hmm. I think it's fun. I think the reason that got me really want to do vlog, showing stories of different parts, is the misconceptions on international media on China. So at first, I wasn't that active on social media, but until several years ago. Um, especially uh, during the riots in Hong Kong and uh, during the, the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan. I was one of the reporters that was sent to Wuhan when the city was under lockdown. Oh, ah, when the corona, COVID broke out. Yeah, so I was covering that under lockdown. So I, I know what really happened there. I hope you didn't get affected. No, I didn't. So the thing is, and what being depicted by international media, especially Western media, is nothing real. It's nothing, it's far from the truth in China. And so I was thinking, okay, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in China. I'm a journalist that got to go to these places and see what's really happening. And I speak both languages. I can speak for myself. You, you, you just send a random reporter who know nothing about us and uh, just write about us with the uh, stereotypes, with the bias, with the prejudice. I hate it. So that I can tell my culture and tell my stories. Uh, let me tell my own culture and my own, and my own stories. So I started to do vlogs to show different corners, uh, diff all the stories of different people in China. And it's really interesting. What, just, just when I did it, a lot of people started to follow me. I didn't know I would be popular. It was beyond my imagination. I was like, why are you all so interested in the contents in Maybe random corners natural. in China? Probably that's why. Maybe you were very natural, that's why. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was natural and what I show is real. People can, can identify. Yeah. Uh, can identify. They know you're telling the truth. And also, maybe because those stuff, those, those interactive uh, interesting people, interesting stories are rarely being be t depicted by Western media. So people who are really curious about China, they say, oh, that's a content I've never seen in other places before. So they start to share my pictures on other platforms. They start to share my videos on other platforms. So it was really the followers who keep sharing my contents and make my contents popular. Mm -hmm. So they have an enthusiasm in understanding China. And I noticed that the situation for China is n China is not alone. Uh, countries like Pakistan and many countries in, in the global south also facing the similar situation. Our stories are often being distorted, uh, misrepresented, yeah, misrepresented by international media. Yeah. So I hope since now I'm kind of popular, so I want to go to different parts of the world and show there, the people in those places show people in Pakistan, show the stories in Pakistan to the outside world. Let them see, see, this is the real Pakistan. Very, very this right. is not what your stereotypes. Yeah, uh, that, <laughs> that's amazing that you're here in Pakistan. And that's an understatement that you're popular. You've got more than 3 million followers. <laughs> if I had three, more than 3 million followers, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> 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 so um, tell me, Ajing, what was the first vlog that you made? Do you remember? the first oh my god uh, it took me some time to think but I remember uh, the first one that was got really popular was when I was in Tibet uh, uh, in 20 late 2022 I was traveling to Tibet with some of my uh, co-workers we were doing uh, a report reporting so I started to share pictures and the local people's stories on the international media I think Tibet is one of the regions in China that is being totally misrepresented by the international media. A mysterious region because we don't know much about it. Yeah, and, and it's a very ancient uh, civilization. Yeah, and uh, like Western media, they, they, f they seem like they have so much interest in um, Tibet, but they never really show the, the reality. Yeah, so I went to some monasteries talking to the, the monks, the lamas. I went to different uh, corners of the villages. Really, in the, in the place, it's just like no man's land. It's like probably only one or two uh, herdsmen living there. I, I, I talk to them, like, how do you feel? What, what's your life like? How's your life been changed over the past few decades? So just those simple, and sometimes even just the, the blue skies, because school, uh, skies in Tibet are super blue. <laughs> I don't know why. And the architectures are so beautiful. So just those simple uh, personal stories, the beautiful sceneries, 
attracted followers from around the world. I think that's the first block that just that made really me. got those eyeballs. Yeah. And after that, there was no looking back. <laughs> no looking back. No, you've been traveling through. <laughs> yeah. So, which other countries did you go to? Other countries? Oh, so many. Because I love traveling. Mm -hmm. I really love traveling. Travel and you make vlogs wherever you go. So, Pakistan is the latest one. But before this, mm -hmm. what other countries have you visited? And you made vlogs Ooh, there. So many. Oh, I haven't. Uh, I only started making vlogs in recent years because okay. even before, I loved traveling, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't think. Document it. Yeah, I didn't think document it and showing to the other people because I thought they'd know about it. <coughs> it's only, only in recent years I thought, okay, there are so many things people misunderstood. I'm going to make a vlog and show the real stories. But before that, I always try to, whenever I have a vacation, I will go traveling. I travel to many, many countries in Europe like UK, of course, <laughs> France, Belgium, Netherlands, Switzerland, um, Spain, Germany, uh, like most of Europe. Europe and uh, UK, but what about, uh, you know, like China and the surrounding countries, uh, Southeast Asia? Southeast Asia, yes, I've been to most of Southeast Asia. Uh, you, you asked me what, what kind of sports I did. One sport I, I do is scuba diving. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I love scuba diving. So it's when you're diving to the ocean and yeah. swim with fish, yeah. it's yeah. a really extraordinary <coughs> experience. So I often go to different Southeast Asian countries yeah. because they have great ocean. Yeah. <laughs> and I've also been to North America, but I haven't traveled to our neighboring countries yet. Okay. So I regretted it. I regretted it. But in the past three years, when, when there was COVID, we couldn't travel for the past three years. Ah, yeah. So yeah. you were under lockdown and now yeah. that it's opening up. Yeah. Now it's opening up. So like, let me go to our best friends. Country. Pakistan is indeed a very, very close. And I would say the best friend of China. Mm -hmm. So um, when you travel around, you uh, now that you've started making vlogs and showing a different perspective to the whole world. And as a traveler, you come across so many experiences. You know, some are good, some are not so good. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would like you to narrate uh, a unique experience that you've had till now while you were traveling. And also traveling is an expensive hobby, especially nowadays. Mm. How do you manage, do you earn that much that you can spend <laughs> on your traveling? So I'd like you to answer both these questions. Okay. So for the money part, it is very expensive. So I'm, I'm not a rich person in China. I okay. just earn normal salaries. Okay. But what I do is I don't spend much money on luxurious stuff, okay. like fancy bags okay. uh, or watches, because I, don't, I want to spend money on plane tickets, hotels. hotels. Yes. So like I had to, okay, how to arrange this. So uh, I bought less, and uh, whenever I have a vacation, buy a ticket. Go to those places because travel, and especially scuba diving is also very expensive. expensive. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I save up to mm. travel. Okay. Uh, and because the memories, I think, is much more important mm. than bags. Living life is more important than just, you yeah, know, like, yeah. exactly. And about the good experience and bad experience, I have so many good experience. Uh, but I think there's one, like, I think it's just so, how do, I don't know how to describe it. I think it's a good experience. Mm -hmm. so whenever I go, local people consider me as one of them. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I'm in Pakistan, a lot, sa a lot of people said, oh, you look like a Pakistani. Mm -hmm. I know maybe the clothes, uh, like the clothes help. And, yeah, we have you know, the same kind of features and uh, characteristics. Uh, people from Gilgit, Baltistan, mm -hmm. they, they look, uh, oh, they're, really? they're, it's a neighboring uh, place uh -huh. to China also. Uh -huh. But yeah, we have those kind of features. Right, okay. So I've been considered as uh, a Pakistani here. And um, when I go to, uh, say, America, they think, oh, you look like you're from California because I'm a little bit tan. Uh, so you look like you're from California, you look like American, uh -huh. like Asian, uh, Chinese American. Uh -huh. And I also travel around in China. China, you know, has uh, 56 different ethnic groups. Uh -huh. So a lot of Chinese people, they don't always look like me. Uh -huh. So why, for example, when I go to Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh -huh. because they have 45 different ethnic groups uh -huh. and they look a little bit like you. <laughs> okay. But uh, when I go to Xinjiang, they, they just speak their local language to me because they think I'm one uh, of the local eth ethnic group. When I was in Tibet, mm -hmm. Tibetans also ask me, are you a Tibetan? You look very much like a Tibetan. So they always just say Tibetan language to me. When I go to the Philippines, 
They said, why are you speaking English to me? I said, what other language should I use? <laughs> you're Filipino, or, you're at, or you, at least you're a half Filipino. <laughs> no, so, so, so people, yeah, obviously when they see a foreigner, they get excited, they want to know more about you. But I was talking about, so if you go to an unknown territory or a terrain, uh, I'm sure you don't have friends in all parts of the world, so there must be places where you travel just blindly, mm. you know, on the go. Mm. Uh, how do, did you have any experience where you got lost somewhere or, you know, missed a bus and didn't know what to do, couldn't write, mm. read the sign language, signs and all? Any experience like that? Uh, yeah, but I think there's one bad experience is, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, it's not a put down on America, mm -hmm. but uh, it was one of the few, pl few places that I had bad experiences. Okay. I think I traveled to San Francisco a few years ago, and San Francisco I think is really pretty, very diverse cultures as well, but it's not safe. Okay. And that was before COVID. Okay. I mean, so the economy wasn't that bad. Okay. So it, it's not that safe. I remember one day I was uh, just walking around because I always travel alone. I travel alone. And I was just a girl walking, yeah. on the yeah. walking on the streets in the city center. And it was quite a busy day. Mm -hmm. But I got, to, I got followed by a giant guy okay. in the broad daylight. Okay. He just followed me. When, wherever I go, I took a bus, okay. he's just sit right next to me and stare at me. Oh. So like it's, it was really uncomfortable. You're feeling uncomfortable, okay? It's because the bus was empty oh. and he chose to sit right next right to me and stare at me. And that happened several times. So Maybe that was the first time we saw someone from China. <laughs> Could have been, you know. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm trying to put it, Yeah, you can get strange experiences like that uh, while you're traveling and obviously going to different places and different mm -hmm. visiting different cultures. But mostly they are good experiences, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah. Now I would like to talk a bit more about your visit to Pakistan mm -hmm. and the flagship program CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic mm -hmm. Corridor, the Belt and Road Initiative. I'd like you to say something about that also. But before that, I need to take a short break. It is an, a, a very, very interesting session. I didn't want to take a break, but we have to take a break. So don't go anywhere. Jing Jing is with us. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sky's the Limit. This is Syed Farooq Hassan and I am in conversation with Li Jing Jing, a vlogger, an influencer, a personality with more than 3 million followers, all the way from China. She is here in Pakistan for a short visit. So let's talk to her. Jing Jing, Hi. we have a lot of students from Pakistan who are studying in China. They study medicine and other faculties. So did you happen to come across any student? Oh. Of course. You I did. know so many people. I have so many friends from Pakistan. Oh, really? I met them in China, okay. in different cities. And uh, we have one of our mutual friends, yeah. Zun. Yeah. She's studying at Tsinghua University. She's a PhD scholar. Yeah. Wow. So I know so many people. They're studying in different, different fields. So, and they're very successful. And many of them very fluent in Chinese. Oh, really? Really. Okay. They're really fluent in Chinese. And I know many of them are already working in some Chinese companies here in Pakistan. Okay. And they are really good because they speak English, Urdu, and Chinese. Multilingual. Yeah. So did you hear some things about Pakistan from those students there when you were there in China? Mm -hmm. Did you hear some good stuff about Pakistan? Of course. They so when you decided to come here, where did you go? Where did you land in Pakistan? Mm -hmm. And tell us your, about your visit to Pakistan. This time is a short stay. Mm -hmm. I only stayed in Islamabad and okay. uh, Sahiwa city. Oh, Sahiwa? Yeah. That's <laughs> a rural area. Uh, what made you go to Sahiwa? Because I know this, uh, in, in Sahiwa, there's a major coal fire power plant called yes. Sahiwa yeah. Coal Fire Power Plant. Yes. That's the flagship uh, project under the CPAC. Yes. So the first and also means most beautiful, probably most successful projects uh, under the CPAC. Yeah. And uh, w because I'm also wondering, um, are those Chinese companies can r uh, helping local people here? So I want to take a look. So I visited that factory, and my experience was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the plant was so beautiful, mm -hmm. and uh, I talked to many employees from China, from Pakistan, 
and all of them speak very positively about the whole project. I can give you a few examples. For example, this power plant, uh, it, it reduced, you know, like Pakistan used to suffer a lot of uh, electricity shortfall. Yes. This power plant ha helped to reduce the, I think, at least two hours, two or three hours of uh, electricity. Power shortages, yeah. yeah. So it was really amazing. And also, I think it helped at least uh, two million households. That means 20 million people. people yeah. And 60% uh, of the employees are, uh, of that plant are Pakistanis. Oh. And many of them studied uh, or trained in China. I was really impressive because when I go to there, someone can even just say Chinese to me. I was like, huh? <laughs> because they all, all studied uh, a, a in China. So you know, uh, they, are, they became the cultural bridge between China and Pakistan. Oh. And they are very successful. They are engineers. So I find something also very impressive is now the, the company has been running for how many years? I think since it was built in, uh, started to be built in, since 2014. Uh, yeah, and they finished the huge plant within 22 months, the ah, fastest uh, yes. being finished. Because CPEC was initiated in 2013. So I think yeah. this was probably one of the few, first few yeah. projects. Yeah. So you went and visited Sahiwal and that power plant. Yeah. How did you find Sahiwal as a city? Because it's a, it's a very beautiful native such rural a city uh, and uh, such you know. a shame I haven't got time to visit the city yet but uh, I think that means I have to come back to Pakistan you have to come back <laughs> it's also called the dairy state you know mm -hmm. of Pakistan because we get so much dairy so many dairy products there mm -hmm. from there mm -hmm. uh, which are exportable actually so it's very fine quality and it's known for dairy products mm -hmm. great so that was your visit to the coal plant and uh, you met all the staff there and all. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you had a good time. Otherwise, how did you find the Pakistani culture, hospitality? How were the people? Were they welcoming to you? They're very welcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing is whenever, whenever I go, wherever I go, people always want to take a photo with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they always want to take a photo you with me. You're a famous person, Jing. <laughs> uh, they can't help it. They're so kind. Huh? So that's that. And also they, be, they treat me so well. Everybody, like, they really treat me so well. And I think there's uh, people from both countries yes. understand that we are really good friends. Yes. I can also mention an uh, interesting case in China mm -hmm. because I was, China hosted the Winter Olympics mm -hmm. and the University, World University Games yeah. recently. Yeah. So the two sports games, you know, when there was a sports game, each, de each country's delegation will walk into the stadium. So Pakistan's delegation is the only foreign delegation that receives the Clapping. loudest yes. applause and I was and watching shout. that ceremony on TV and yeah, I, so I do remember. Those thousands of Chinese audiences no one asked them to do that, just mm -hmm. voluntarily do that. So they know, oh, that's our Iron Brothers. Let's mm -hmm. give the loudest mm -hmm. welcome and yes. shout. We have a lot of artists also for, who are very famous in China, uh, Pakistani movies. And, you know, we watch Chinese movies also. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we've all grown up with Park China friendship, uh, long live Park China friendship. Yeah. We call it Park China, Park Chin Dosti Zindabad. Oh. You know, that, that's our slogan. And right from childhood, you know, we've, this is inculcated in our blood in our lives that China is our ironclad uh, friend, uh, you know, like it's our best friend. So probably that's the reason. And otherwise, Pakistan is a very hospitable uh, yeah. nation. Mm -hmm. um, and you the know, food is amazing too. I need to like mention that I love the food. What did you try? Uh, I can't. I can't recite Biryani, all the names. Rice. I think all, all that, okay. all the barbecues, okay. all the lambs, all the meat, all the rice. Okay, and uh, we are very fond of Chinese food, by the way. I oh, really? If you try the Chinese food, you might not, not find it as Chinese as in China, but we love Chinese food here. Uh, you know, that, that's one of our, you know, like best cuisines. Even at the Sahiwa Power Plant, because they have uh, Chinese canteens and Pakistani canteens, uh, they worry that that I am not getting used to local food. I'm like, no, take me to Pakistani canteen. I want to try that. <laughs> I want to try that. <laughs> Obviously, when you're traveling, you want to try it. Yeah, and so, I is, insist on going back. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> no, I I would love to try a hot pot any day. Oh. Hot pot is one of my. You need favorites. to come to China. I will I, take you to all I, the best I restaurants. I would love to. I've been to Beijing, but again, that was a very brief uh, trip. That was for a seminar. But uh, inshallah, uh, God willing, I'll I'll visit there again. So, um, generally speaking, uh, this was your first visit to Pakistan, I'm sure first of the many more to come. But comparatively, like the other places that you've been around, how would you compare or rank Pakistan 
you know, oh. how is it different or how is it, you know, mm. how would you compare it? I, I love it. I love everything I experience in Pakistan now. Uh, there are some similarities, I think, in terms of our culture. Um, you know, we have a large Muslim communities in China, so yeah. I always go to their restaurant, and uh, I have many Muslim friends. Mm -hmm. So when I'm getting here, I think every, I got used to the food and the culture, everything so easily because I, I'm already familiar with that. Mm -hmm. So there's like uh, adapted so quick, and also the, the 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 welcome as a Chinese that I received is so unique. Yeah. I think it's probably only something special between China and Pakistan. Pakistanis yes. in China will Absolutely. receive unique welcomes and we are the same. We well, are well, right? very welcoming to all our guests, but from China, they receive special treatment mm -hmm. because the love comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, one, it's in our nature, but otherwise it comes from the heart. Uh, would you like to say a few words about China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPEC, the flagship program, mm -hmm. which has been a real booster for Pakistan? And uh, for China, again, I'm sure it's, it's a major initiative because it involves a lot of countries mm. and accessing warm waters and bringing the world on one platform. That, mm. That's the, you know, like yeah. the bigger vision. Mm. What would you like to say about uh, BRI and CPEC? I think BRI really so impressive to me as a journalist. I'm not saying it as a, as a Chinese. It's like uh, I'm just praising my own country's programs. No. I, s I think it's impressive because I talk to con people from different countries. So uh, what would you like to say about uh, the flagship program, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the Belt and Road Initiative? Mm. I think Belt and Road Initiative is really, really impressive. It will improve the living standards of all the whole global south, all developing nations. I said it as a journalist, not as a Chinese who is just praising my country's projects, no. Because I said it because I've interviewed and talked to people from different continents, from different countries in Africa, from different countries in the Middle East, different countries in, in Latin America, South America, and Caribbean. And they all said those projects have dramatically changed the living standards because it, it, it brings the infrastructure, the power plant, which bring, gives them electricity, roads, high speed rails, and Western media. Mis misrepresented BRI because they only focused on loans or whether the investor investors are from China and actually the loans from China and loans from MF are completely different because the projects under BRI are the projects that boost the productivity of a country. Mm -hmm. So with roads, with high-speed rails, with a power plant, the people can have a much better life. They can develop their economy. So they can stand up on their own feet. And eventually, of course, they, they, will, they will pay back the loans. But loans from IMF, from Western institutions, it just filled the gap from a previous loan. It brings nothing to local people. It brings nothing to local economy. So mm -hmm. that's very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, BRI, I think, is shares the experience of China's um, uh, poverty alleviation project. Because China first eliminated 8 million people out of extreme poverty in his own country. Mm -hmm. And now, since we are out of extreme poverty, and uh, through the BRI, we can share our experience and uh, share our uh, skills in building infra infra infrastructures to other countries, and eventually help all the people suffering in pow poverty, uh, suffering from unfair treatment from Western institutions. So I mean, that's very dif different. Just like what I saw at the Sahiwa power plant. I mean. For example, I talked to uh, one of the engineers who is now being promoted as the uh, leader. He's a Pakistani. He's a leader now in, in the power plant. Mm -hmm. And he joined the company like seven or eight years ago. He started as a trainee engineer in the company. Mm -hmm. And because back then, he didn't have much experience working with the power plant. Mm -hmm. But then during the eight years, he been promoted grade by grade, level by level, and he was sent to China to study, Training. to be trained, mm -hmm. to train more about how to run, to be an engineer, how to run a, a coal power plant. And, and now he's one of the four or six Pakistanis being promoted as a shift leader. Which and is a big achievement. Yeah, and the whole central control, I don't know how to call that in their factory, but the whole control room are all run by Pakistanis. No. So, I mean, those people are growing with the company. Yes. So that's different. And so, as a, as a saying, give a man a fish, you only feed from 
feed him for feed him for a day. For one day, yeah. yeah and if you teach him how to, to fish, fish you feed him for for life, life and and to change the lives of many other people. Yeah. So I think this uh, CPEC and BRI it's it's an excellent initiative and obviously thanks to the vision of uh, Excellency Xi Jinping, um, you know who, who envisioned it and who rolled it out. And uh, for Pakistan, it is uh, bringing in a um, lot of fruits. Obviously, we're very, we're very happy, and hopefully, this will be a major contributor towards our uh, growth, for that matter. Tell us uh, something about China's, uh, you know, like uh, the education sector. You have a lot of uh, ancient universities, a lot of historic institutions like Tsinghua. Mm -hmm. It's uh, an amazing institution. We have a lot of students visiting there. And it is known, like people from all over the world go and study in China, uh, different faculties, especially medicine. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe yes. you have a special, uh, and then you have that, that acupuncture, you know, which yeah. is very <laughs> unique to China, and other studies also. So tell us a bit about the culture and the education sector in China. Education sectors. I can say that university in China are now really welcoming international students. Whichever country you are from, especially if you are from developing nations, global south countries, those universities welcome to join because I mean, that's really important to provide better education. For, and so we can lift the entire global south up. And uh, I'm sure you will have awesome experiences. Um, if you want to go to Beijing, there are Tsinghua University, Peking University. They are the best uh, universities. Yep. Um, but there are also other very well-known universities back in Peking. And also, if you want to study engineers, there are also other provinces. Other provinces have well, also made. That yeah, okay. I think one of the uh, Pakistani employee at the Sahiwa power plant is studied at Xibei Gongye Dashui, which is in the city of Xi'an. Xi'an has, uh, and he find very easy to live there because Xi'an is a Muslim majority city. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it, every, many things are very similar. You can have enjoy the food. There, are, the Xi'an Grand Mosque is amazing. The most beautiful, the most Asian mosque ever. Mm. I'm sorry, there's a movie in China. <laughs> but uh, and also, it, it Xi'an is also unique because it was the starting point of Asian Silk Road. Mm. So there's a connection between Xi'an and Pakistan. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. No, but there, um, I wish you would have stayed here more, but there are a lot of like, even Islamabad, Faisal Mosque is one place that you should not miss. Um, it's one of the most grandest mosques uh, that I've ever uh, seen, uh, obviously. Uh, and then there's so many other historical sites here uh, in Islamabad uh, or in Punjab for that matter. The, the Mughal uh, Empire, uh, you know, the place where they used to rule, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all those, uh, we have those uh, sites uh, covered, so you can visit that on your next visit. Mm -hmm. Any special message that you'd like to give to the people of Pakistan mm. or the students or the youth of Pakistan who are watching you, uh, God has been kind, you've made it big, you have so many followers to yourself, uh, you know, you've, uh, you're a very famous vlogger traveling internationally, how does it what kind of message would you like to give being such a strong influencer? Um, I think we all know that China and Pakistan have really, really good relationship. We are iron brothers and we should help each other, especially in this changing world. And it's time for all of us from the global south, from developing nations to unite and uh, fight against the unfair treatment that we have been suffered for such a long time. We can stand on our, our own feet when we should help each other. And through BRI, through CPAC, I think we can all develop our economy and make the world a much better place. So I hope you can come join me and feel free to come to my platforms and subscribe to my channel. And I hope to share more stories uh, from the world to you, and I would love to share stories of Pakistanis, uh, pa Pakistan's culture to the whole world. Thank you very much, uh, Jing. That was, um, that was a very good message. And I think what I've inferred from uh, Jing Jing, you know, the secret of success to her vlog is being herself, being natural, and exploring those aspects which are hidden or which are misrepresented in general talks. So I think that's probably the secret of success. And I wish you more success, Jing Jing. And I, I expect you to visit Pakistan again and again. I will. And do more <laughs> vlogs on Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, 
we love China. Uh, it's our ironclad friend, and uh, we hope and we pray that CPEC is beneficial not only for Pakistan, not only for China, but for the whole world. Yeah. Thank you very much. With Thank you. With this note, we come to the end of uh, this episode of Sky's the Limit. Till we meet again, Allah Hafiz.